Have you ever wondered if the Bible is actually true? I mean, it is a fair question. Some people claim it's 100% from God, front page all the way to the back. Others dismiss it completely as just an ancient religious myth used to help weak people feel better about themselves. Now, maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Maybe you've grown up around it enough to appreciate some of the wisdom and you've got some respect for the book, but deep down, you might really wonder if everything in there really happened just like it's written. After all, how can a book that's written thousands of years ago really be trusted today? Today, we're putting the Bible to the test, looking at historical discoveries, ancient manuscripts, and archaeological findings to see if the Bible really does measure up. And not only that, but to answer an even bigger question, is this book trustworthy enough for you to build your life around? How do you know like the Bible doesn't have these human aspects and it wasn't changed by religion over the years? How do you kind of have this trust in the Bible that it's purely from God and it tells the pure truth about Jesus? There's a lot of time that passed. 2,000 years have passed. Right. What if something's been changed? Most of the Bible would be thrown out as hearsay if we were in a court. The Bible on its own is not sufficient. Welcome back to my series, The Bible Doesn't Make Any Sense. So I can name a few contradictions in the Bible. Reading the Bible literally is dangerous. Uh, the Bible has been changed many times. Too many times. The likelihood of someone coming back to life is very low. This is what I struggled with in my 20s. Why do I believe what the Bible says? Like, how do I know anything about God? Why do I believe what I believe? I mean, the answer to that question I knew is because the Bible said so, but how do I know the Bible's true? What if it was made up? How do I know that it hasn't been changed? Like, what if what I'm reading right now isn't what they originally wrote? How do I... Honestly, I think the thing that scared me the most is that I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to find any objective answers on how I could determine whether or not the Bible was true. And I was just going to be left with, well, it's just faith. You just have to believe it. Because I didn't think that that was going to be enough for me. I needed something somehow outside of the Bible. This sounds so bad to say, but I, I kind of I needed something that could vouch for it that would, man, it sounds bad now from this perspective to say that I needed something inferior to vouch for something superior, right? But if I'm just being completely transparent, it's kind of what I needed. I needed a way to determine whether or not the Bible was true without using the Bible to determine that it's true. And I'm wondering if you've ever wondered whether or not the Bible is true. Because if it's not, then it's only as valuable to me as it is helpful to me. But if it ever becomes a distraction to, my, to me or the direction that I want to go in my life, then I should just let it go. But if it is true, well, then <laughs> there's probably some things that we're going to have to change in our lives. Um, because if we're going to be completely honest, if it's true... There's some things in there that it says not to do that we need to stop doing. And there's some things that it says we should be doing that we ought to make a bigger priority in our lives. I heard an atheist say one time, he said, if all, and by the way, he was saying this as his argument against the Bible. He said, if all knowledge in the world was destroyed, in a thousand years, the only information that would come back to us is science. Things that are observable and things that you can make an experiment with. Things like mathematics, biology, physics, chemistry, and sociology. But it's that last one that wouldn't come back, sociology. We'd lose almost every bit of that one because sociology is a story study of the origin, development, organization, and function of human society, or in other words, history. History is not repeatable. And it's only observable by those who recorded it while it was happening. And then it can never be lived or experienced the same way again. So we would lose everything we know about the past. But losing the written historical record 
doesn't mean that all of sociology and history is fiction. Losing the information regarding, for instance, the construction of the pyramids is tragic. Like there are, do a, a search on Netflix and you'll find dozens of documentaries about different theories. Like it's one of the things people like feel like they really need to know, but we don't have that information. Now that doesn't mean that nobody built the pyramids. Obviously somebody had to build them, but because we've lost that information, we don't know how it was built. We don't know where they came from. And the same thing is true with the Bible. It is a written historical account of actual people who lived in specific times in specific places who had very real experiences with a very real God. So of course, that could never be rewritten the same way, just like no other document of history could be rewritten the same way. But that doesn't mean it isn't based in facts, that it isn't true, or that it never happened. I think the real question is whether or not the Bible is accurate, like historically reliable, accurate. But maybe the question we need to answer first is why it even matters. Uh, in this new series, we're looking at the last things taught by six different disciples to the church at large um, in that first century. And if the Apostle Paul, and that's who we're looking at today, if the Apostle Paul, if he had a super strength, it would probably be leadership development. He wrote more of the letters after the book of Acts, and by the way, from Genesis to the book of Acts in the New Testament, is a historical narrative of God's interaction with mankind. You get to the end of the book of Acts, and that's the end of the history part. And then the rest of the New Testament are letters that different disciples wrote to the church that Jesus started. Paul wrote more than any of them. And in his letters, there's 36 different people's names that are mentioned that he spent significant time with mentoring and developing as leaders. Now, when you read the book of Acts, there's a whole nother 50 plus names that are mentioned that he interacted with and influenced. And the guy that is mentioned, I think most often, is Timothy. Timothy seems to be the guy that Paul picked to be his successor, the guy that he was going to hand off the ministry responsibilities to uh, when he passed, when he went to Rome. So he writes a letter to Timothy, the first letter we refer to as 1 Timothy. He writes another letter to Timothy at the very end of his life. Yeah, we refer to that second letter as 2 Timothy. And in chapter 3 of the last letter that he writes to the guy he's handing everything off to, he writes in verse 14, he says, but you must remain faithful to the things that you've been taught. So he gets to the end and says, listen, the most important thing is that you stay faithful to what you've been taught. You know that these things are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. Because they were teaching you from, you have been taught the Holy Scriptures since you were a little boy, and they have given you the wisdom to receive salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture, all of scripture, is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right, and God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So the Apostle Paul says in his last letter to Timothy, he says, it's the Bible, it's the scriptures, dude, that teaches you what's right and wrong in your life. It also corrects us and shows us what we ought to be doing instead. And it helps us become the person that we were created to become. That's why it matters. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, he says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but it's the word of God that stands forever. So God's word stands forever. Isaiah also wrote in chapter 55, verse 11, he said, so uh, my word, it is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but my word, the word of God, will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Like here, Isaiah kind of implies that it's the Bible that when it gets applied into somebody's life, God says, it's my words in somebody's life that actually accomplishes the thing I was hoping would happen 
in their life. David said in Psalm chapter 19, verse 7, he said, The instructions of the Lord are perfect. They revive your soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, and they're able to make simple people to become wise. And the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he said, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword because it can cut between our soul and spirit right on the inside of who we are between joint and marrow, he says, and exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before where you're reading something in the Bible or you've heard a sermon and then a Bible verse is read and it kind of like slaps you in the face <laughs> and it cuts, like, do you remember that scene in uh, Shrek where uh, Donkey goes, uh, you cut me deep, Shrek, you cut me deep. Uh, that's that's kind of what the scriptures do. They, they cut you deep. The writer of Hebrews says, it's almost like the scriptures have a mind of their own, like they move like independent of our intentions when we read them with a soft heart. So it seems that the Bible is acknowledging that the hinge on which all of our faith swings is whether or not the Bible is reliably true. Well, then that brings me back to questions I threw out at the beginning, which is, is the Bible that I have today what was originally written? How accurate is the Bible's account of the things that it records? And is there any outside evidence to substantiate anything that's written inside of it? And thankfully, there is an actual way that you can objectively answer these three questions. Now, if you've been a part of Grace Church for any amount of time, you know that we, we actually teach this teaching every other year. So every two years, we talk about whether or not the Bible is reliable and accurate and historically true because we recognize that it is the one thing on which our faith rests. And if it's not true, then, well, then we're all kind of all on our own, aren't we? To just pick and choose from the smorgasbord, from the buffet of all the religious options. But if the Bible is true, then religion is not a buffet. There is, there is one path, because the Bible says there's one path to God, and that would be Jesus. So the answer to the first question is actually determined by the bibliographical test. The bibliographical test says, if today all we have are copies of the originals, there are no originals in existence today, do we know that our copies match the original? For instance, how do we know that Plato said, no one is more hated than he who speaks the truth. Like that's something that everybody says, we all acknowledge that Plato said that, but how do we know he actually said that? Because we don't have any of Plato's writings in his actual handwriting. We have copies of what he said, but how do we know that those copies are reliable? Um, so because it was written that he said that, we believe it, but how do we know that that's what he originally wrote? And the way that we do that is we gather all of the ancient manuscripts of Plato's speeches. We count the number of ancient manuscripts that we have, and then we date the oldest copy. We determine how much distance is our oldest copy from when Plato actually lived. And the closer it is in time to when Plato actually lived, the more likely it is to be true. And the more number of manuscripts that we can all find that agree with our oldest one, the more likely it is to be true. So we date the distance between our oldest copy and the time when it was supposed to have been said, and the more matches we find with that old copy, and the closer it is to when he supposedly have said it, the more likely we are to know what he actually said. It's like the telephone game. Pretend there are two classrooms of 60 students, and a teacher tells the first student a phrase like, hey diddle diddle, the cat in the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. And then that kid has to tell the second kid who has to tell the third who has to tell the fourth. And on and on until it gets all the way to the 60th kid. Well, you're in the hallway. You know what the teacher said to the first kid. You step out into the hallway and you wait for the last kid to come out. 
what are the odds that after going through 60 different kids, the 60th kid is going to walk out to you and tell you the exact same thing that the teacher said to the first kid? Not very likely. So there's no way to know what the teacher originally said, unless the teacher says it to two different classrooms. Now, if the teacher says it to the first kid in each classroom, and it makes it all the way to the 60th kid, makes it all the way to the 60th kid, this kid comes out and gives us the phrase, and this kid comes out and gives us the phrase, and their phrases match, then there's a higher likelihood that this is what the teacher originally said to the first kid. Now you know that it was translated accurately. Now, if each classroom is a different copy of one of Plato's manuscripts, and each one of those 60 kids represent 25 years of time, then how many classrooms do you have that match? And what chair does the oldest manuscript match? So I hope I didn't lose you on that. But if each classroom represents a different manuscript that we have of something that was said, I want to find out how many classrooms do we have a kid whose phrase from the original matches all of the other kids. And then I want to find, of all of the kids who come out and tell us, how close to the original, like if, we have, if they're all 60, great, but if I can find somebody who's from chair 40, and that matches chair 60, then chair 40 is closer to chair 1, so I'm more confident that chair 40 is what chair 1 was told than chair 60, but if chair 60 matches chair 40, then I know that they both match, and that is most probably what the teacher actually said. So the greater number of classrooms that we have with matching phrases, and the lower the number of the kid who comes out to tell us what the teacher said, the more likely we know the original phrase. So let's look at some ancient documents. So with Plato, there are seven different ancient manuscripts that agree. So we have a kid walking out into the, into the hallway with a matching line from the teacher from seven different classrooms. And there's a time gap, by the way, between the oldest manuscript and Plato by 1,200 years, so that would be equivalent to chair number 48. So if each chair represents 25 years, then we have seven different classrooms who have a kid walk out in the hallway and tell us the exact same thing. So we're like, oh yeah, we're pretty confident we know exactly what that first teacher said. And the kid closest to the teacher that we have is from chair number 48, which is awesome. And by the way, that's enough for us to be able to say objectively that what we have today of Plato's writings is what he originally wrote. Aristotle. There are 49 ancient manuscripts that agree, and the oldest is 1,400 years after Aristotle actually lived. So to go back to the classroom, if we don't know what the teacher said, all we know is what the student's coming out into the hallway to tell us. We've got 49 different classrooms where the kid came into the hallway and they all gave us the exact same entire manuscript of Aristotle's writing. And the oldest one is from chair 56. So it's close to the end of the 60 chairs. But we have 49 kids that walked into the hallway saying the same thing. So. All historians say that what we have today is, is what Aristotle originally wrote. So we can't keep doing this with all the different, I'm only gonna give you two more examples. So the third example that I'm gonna give you is Homer, and not from Simpson, but Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. And of Homer's writing, we have 500 different ancient manuscripts scattered around that all perfectly match. It'd be like us trying to figure out what, like if Homer's the teacher, what did Homer say to the first kid? We don't know because we don't have Homer's original handwriting. What we do have, though, is 500 classrooms that had a kid walk into the hall and tell us the exact same thing. That's enough to say that we for sure know what Homer told the first kid. What are the odds that all of them would be saying the same thing? But the coolest thing is that the kid that stepped into the hallway closest to the teacher, the manuscript closest to Homer and what he originally wrote, is from chair number 20. I told you I'm only going to give you one more example, and that's the Christian New Testament. Of the Christian New Testament, we have over, are you ready for this? 24,000 ancient manuscripts that agree. 
24,000. 24 classrooms, 24,000 classrooms, excuse me, that have had somebody walk into our lives today and say the exact same thing. And the seat that the oldest one comes from is from chair number one. So there are 24,000 ancient manuscripts of the degree, and the oldest one comes from 25 years after the original was written. So if we can be confident about anything from history being accurate to what was originally written, then we can be confident that the Bible hasn't been changed at all from when it was originally written. But how do we know that what they wrote was true? How do we know they didn't make up the stuff about the resurrection of Jesus? How do we know they weren't making up um, his miracles, the water into wine, the um, walking on the water? How do we know? How do we know that they were telling the truth? And the rule for this, there's actually a rule for this, is called Aristotle's Dictum. And Aristotle's Dictum says that when you find a piece of historical literature, you are to assume that they're telling the truth unless you have evidence that they're lying. So technically speaking, the rule of archaeology in ancient history would say that you automatically have to assume they were telling the truth unless you can prove otherwise. But... You'd say, that's ah, awfully convenient. Well, that's actually how we determine the truthfulness of all other pieces of literature. So if you wouldn't accept that for the New Testament, then it's because you're being biased against it, which in my 20s, I kind of was, and so I needed a little bit more than that. But a document is known to be true based on the closeness of the person who's writing about it in space and time to the things that they're writing about. So the accuracy of a historical event is determined by the proximity of the writer to the event they're writing about in, play, in, in space and time. Uh, for instance, uh, you and I might both remember 9-11, but if you were in, so we were the same closeness in time, but if you were in New York City during 9-11, then you were closer, uh, we're closer, sorry, in time, but if you were in New York City, when it happened, then you're closer in space to it, like spatially. You're closer to the place that it happened. I was in Boston when it happened. So if there were any discrepancies between your account and my account, while we both lived during the event that we're writing about, because you were closer to it spatially than I was, then your account would be more accurate. Uh, neither of us were with Ronald Reagan when he was shot, but I do remember watching it on TV and how it affected kids at school. But if you were born after uh, Reagan was shot, so if you're younger than I am, by more than, what, 11 years? If you're younger than me, by more than 11 years, while neither one of us were close to it geographically, I was closer to it in time than you. So my account would more likely to be true than yours because I actually remember that time in history, even if I wasn't there at that place in history. So how close were the writers of the scriptures to the events they recorded? Acts chapter 4 verse 20 says, we cannot stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. That's Peter. You can't be any closer than that. First John chapter 1 verse 1, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, who we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. And John is the one who had said that, so you can't get any closer than that. Luke chapter 1 verse 1 through 4, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us, he says. They use the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully uh, investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so that you can be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. So he wasn't actually an eyewitness, but he interviewed those who were. So you can't get any closer than that. So, and that that's fine. So they're the right people to write about it, but what if they lied or what if they exaggerated? That would be my next question. There are three ways that you can tell whether or not they told the truth. Uh, the first is that they appealed to common knowledge in their defense. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter said to the Jews, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene, 
by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. All right? How did the people respond? Like if they knew he was lying, then they would have said, oh, you're full of dog doo-doo. <laughs> what was their response? Well, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the response was that 3,000 of them repented of their sins and were baptized and added to that church that added to the church that day. Why? Because they knew that what Peter was saying was true. Paul to Festus, a Roman ruler, uh, said suddenly, or excuse me, to Agrippa. He says, uh, and we talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. Suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. But Paul replied, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is the sober truth. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly because I am sure these events are all familiar to him, for they were not done in a corner. And he says this to Agrippa in front of thousands of eyewitnesses. And Agrippa doesn't contradict him at all because Agrippa knows that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. The second way I know that they were not exaggerating and they, they were telling the truth is that the disciples could not have afforded to risk any inaccuracies because they would have been exposed as frauds by those who were eyewitnesses who could disprove them. And then the message would have never of Jesus' resurrection would have never left Jerusalem. But here's what we know from history outside of the Bible, that Christianity spread faster during the lifetime of eyewitnesses who could verify the truthfulness or prove that it was a lie than at any other time in history. So if Christianity grew fastest during the lifetime of eyewitnesses, who could prove it was true if it wasn't, the only thing that actually makes sense, as nonsensical as it may appear to you or me, is that they were telling the truth. In fact, the historian F.F. F. Bruce says, had there been any tendency to depart from the facts in any respect, the presence of eyewitnesses and the audience would have served to correct them. So that's how we know that they were telling the truth. And the third reason they were telling, we know they were telling the truth is that there's no explanation for the martyrs if they were lying. People will die for a lie that they believe, but who dies for a lie they made up? So if all the disciples are sitting around like, hey, we know that Jesus died, he's not around anymore, but let's write... Let's all agree that we're going to tell everybody that he did raise from the dead. And everybody's like, all right, that sounds great. Well, then when that became illegal and they were going to be tortured to death for a lie they knew they had made up, at what point in the Colosseum when they were dipped in oil and set on fire by Nero, are they going to change their story and admit that they were making it up? You see what I'm saying? Like people die for a lie they believe, but nobody dies for a hoax a lie they made up. And even if you could say, well, the disciples, the 12 disciples, they might have done that. Okay. But what about the hundreds and thousands of other martyrs in the first century who were tortured to death and killed? And all any of them would have had to do to save their own skins was admit that they were making it up and none of them changed their story? Like the only thing that makes sense is that they were telling the truth. Uh, Chuck Colson is a guy who's associated with, uh, I am not a crook, Watergate, right? Uh, when Nixon was impeached, uh, Chuck Colson was in his cabinet and went to jail for his participation uh, in that crime. He said this, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. And every one of them were beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep their lie straight for three weeks. You're telling me that 12, apostle, 12 apostles could keep that lie going for 40 years? He goes, absolutely impossible. And then the last thing, is in there is there any evidence outside of the Bible that would help us confirm that the stuff that's in the Bible is true? William F. Albright, the famous archeologist wrote, 
All radical schools in New Testament criticism, which have existed in the past or which exist today, are pre-archaeological and are therefore antiquated by today's standards. Joseph Free says, archaeology has confirmed countless passages which have been rejected by critics as unhistorical or contradictory to facts, to known facts in the past. In other words, things that uh, people had said, oh, that can't be true, that can't be true. Well, the more they find out about archaeology, the more that stuff ends up being proven true. Aaron Sherwin-White says, for X, the confirmation of historicity is overwhelming. Any attempt to reject its basic historicity, even in matters of the smallest detail, now appear absurd. Roman historians have long taken the Book of Acts for granted as a historically reliable document. Sir William Ramsey spent 15 years trying to disprove Luke, uh, the account of Jesus in the book of Luke and Luke's account of the apostles in the Acts of the Apostles. And he says, he, he finally, after trying to disprove the Bible, goes, Luke is a historian of the first rank and this author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians in all of history. <laughs> then there are some other things that the Bible says that I, 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 find, I find fascinatingly cool. Like Job chapter 26, verse 7 says that God stretches the northern sky over empty space and he hangs the earth on nothing. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22 was quoted by uh, Christopher Columbus to Queen Isabella because she thought, even though there were other people that knew that the world was round, it was still generally accepted to be flat and she was afraid to finance him. And in his writings to her, to prove to her that he wouldn't fall off the edge of the earth, Christopher Columbus quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, which says, God sits above the circle. The actual word in Hebrew means sphere. So he quoted to her that God sits above the sphere of the earth and the people below him seem like grasshoppers to him. Job chapter 38 talks about the fountains of the deep, that underneath the bottom of the ocean, on the ocean's floor, there's more fountains that feed that, and we didn't discover that until the 1960s. Genesis chapter 1 clearly indicates that we are a water-based planet, and evolutionary scientists believe that we were an Earth-based planet until the 70s, and they said, well, actually, we're a water-based planet, and those of us who had read Genesis chapter 1, we were like, right, we, we already read that in the first chapter. Genesis chapter 10 makes reference to Pangaea. Uh, Dr. Clark Pinnock says there exists no document from the ancient world witnessed by so excellent a set of textual and historical testimonies and offering so superb an array of historical data on which an intelligent decision may be made. An honest person cannot dismiss a source of this kind, referencing the Bible. Skepticism regarding the historic credentials of Christianity is therefore based on an irrational and anti-supernatural bias. So what do we do with this information? We thank God for the historical account that we have of the human experience with God. We thank God that he has ensured that this account would remain so that he could be found by us, so that we could know who he is and who we are, and so that we could figure out how to find our way back to our creator. We thank God that our faith is based on history, like actual history, rather than just religious dogma or a set of helpful spiritual principles. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he did not. That has nothing to do with theology and everything to do with history. And it's one of the most historically verifiable events in the human story. Wolfhart Pannenberg, former professor at University of Chicago, Claremont School of Theology, University of Munich and Harvard said, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it's a very unusual event. And second, if you believe that it happened, you have to change the way you live your life. And that's the point. Destroy every Bible on the planet in a thousand years from now, Religion would still be alive even if misguided because nature itself points us to a, create, a cre creator. The universal agreement on certain things being morally right or wrong in all human civilizations across time points to a moral lawgiver. The presence of our conscience points to a judge to whom we will one day give an account for our actions. So I thank God 
that we have the scriptures so that we know who that creator and that moral lawgiver is, what he values, and how to make it through Judgment Day. Thankfully, according to the Bible, it will never be destroyed. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, as the scripture says, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever, which is awesome. So the resurrection of Jesus is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of history. It's not even a theological matter. And it is the most demonstrably true event from the past. And if Jesus rose from the dead, then that guy was right. Then we're all going to have to change the way we live. And then there's those of us who would say, I don't want to do that. So regardless of the evidence, I'm not going to believe it's true. And the craziest thing about God is as much as he loves you and wants you to embrace him, he would let you reject him and walk away, which is crazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray in a minute. And I want to give you a th uh, an opportunity, if you're a Christian, to thank God for making himself ac accessible to us through him. I'm also going to ask you to consider if there's any area of your life that you know is out of line with what the Bible has to say, and I'm going to give you a chance to bring your life in alignment. And if you're disconnected from God, I think this would be a pretty cool opportunity for you to reach out to him and ask him to make you his too. So let's pray. God, I love you with all of my heart, and I'm thankful for the scriptures. I'm thankful that in the Bible, we find our way back to you. So God, for those of us who have embraced the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as the only thing that fully pays off the debt that we owe you because of the way that we've rebelled against you, we've broken the commandments and been selfish towards our fellow man, I, I want to say thank you. We want to say thank you. God, show us the places in our life that don't align with what the Bible has to say because as Paul said to Timothy in his last letter, realigning our lives is how we discover the person that you created us to be. So God, that's what we're doing. So if there's any sin in your heart, then your prayer is, God, forgive me for this sin. Help me to let go of the things you want me to let go of and help me to pick up the things you want me to pick up. And God, for those of us who are disconnected from you, if that's you, your prayer is, God, I don't want to be disconnected anymore. If Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day to pay for my sins and give me new life, I want that. One, I want my sins taken away. And I want a second a second chance, that life, that's what I want. Make that your prayer. God, make me yours. Become a part of my life for the rest of my life. And help me be the man, the woman that you created me to be. This is our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we all say it together, amen. So this video might not have answered all the questions that you have, but I hope that you still found something helpful from today. Maybe you were challenged to reconsider if you can believe and trust what the Bible has to say, or maybe your confidence in the Bible was just strengthened. Regardless, we're open to keep the conversation going and help you navigate questions about life and faith. So let us know what you're thinking, what stood out to you, and what you're still struggling with. You can leave us a comment below or connect with us directly by using the info that you see on your screen. Here at Grace Church, we really do want to help you discover more about God and discover the purpose that he has created you for. So if there's anything that we can do to help, just let us know. That's it for the day. We'll see you again next time.